Thanks for joining us today, Tyler. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Thank you for having me, y'all. It's great to have you. So first questions first. We're talking about Buddhism. What is Buddhism? Is it a religion? Does it believe in God? What is Buddhism? Yeah, so um, I kind of follow Jay Garfield on this. So he has a, a really great book. It's kind of been somewhat like the must-have book in reference to analytic philosophy and Buddhism called uh, Engaging Buddhism. And uh, in it, he kind of has uh, all the kind of necessary conditions for um, for Buddhism, or he thinks that at least most Buddhists will affirm these kind of uh, various stances. And uh, at the heart of kind of the metaphysics of Buddhism is this idea of interdependence and permanence and emptiness. And uh, so I take these kind of to be the essential um metaphysical views of Buddhism, and we can unpack what those are in just a second. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, you might think that uh, the Four Noble Truths uh, or, you know, the Eightfold Path, these are kind of a, a essential um, tenets within Buddhism that, that, that generally any sort of Buddhist would, would affirm. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Do you, do you want me to go ahead and unpack the, the, the impermanence, interdependence, and emptiness theses? Yeah, let's start with that. That sounds great. Uh, right. So um, uh, impermanence is this idea that uh, nothing sustains its its identity, <laughs> that uh, nothing is what it is from moment to moment, that by every passing moment, any sort of subtle change that happens, um, then we actually get like a new thing. So I know it kind of seems like Seth and Jonathan, y'all are here, right, right now. Uh, but as each moment passes, you fail to retain your identity, and now you're like uh, Jonathan two or Seth two, and then in, you know another second Jonathan three, Seth three, right? And so um, the idea of, of impermanence is that no thing is able to uh, retain identity from moment to moment, uh, and then impermanent or sorry interdependence is this idea that all things ultimately conceptually uh, and causally are dependent on other things, right? And then this is how you have some Buddhists who talk about like kind of this whole or oneness uh, idea since uh, there's this uh, interdependence that things uh, have. And this kind of leads to this idea of emptiness, uh, at least on a stronger view of emptiness, um, say uh, a, a view that fits well within the Mahayana tradition. Um, emptiness is this idea that uh, no thing has intrinsic identity, uh, that, there, that there is no intrinsic nature to some sort of substance. Um, and that's because um, there is no independent substance because all are interdependent and, uh, you know, things are, are in flux, things change. And so you have this, this, this idea of emptiness. So this is what I take to be the metaphysics um, behind uh, Buddhism. Uh, there is, of course, like various traditions will say, oh, well, maybe we uh, maybe these apply to things, but maybe we need to talk about something that which is not a thing. And it, uh, maybe in permanence or independence won't be applied to that. Uh, but uh, the general gist of metaphysics of, of Buddhism, I take uh, to be this, especially as articulated by someone like Jay Garfield. Um, you have these uh, uh, really well ar articulated as well in Westerhoff and, and uh, Burton as another couple of uh, analytic um, philosophers who, who engage with Buddhist literature. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, this idea that um, that there's suffering in life <laughs> and that uh, there's a way to get rid of this suffering. Um, there's a way to mitigate it, at least. Um, and uh, obviously, this is going to be by, by way of the, the um, Eightfold Path. Uh, which will include a right realization about reality. So anyway, what by Buddhism, this is kind of what I take to be central for. Now, we commonly hear also that Buddhism is atheistic. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Is it generally true? Or is that just a complete false falsity? Yeah, so um, there are uh, passages um, in Buddhist scripture where um, the Buddha is um, maybe talking with Brahman or something like that, and and Brahman doesn't look so great. <laughs> um, 
obviously Brahmin's like very anthropomorphized. And um, you see um, that in later Buddhist tradition, there are more explicit kind of atheistic arguments, uh, arguments for atheism. Um, however, from my reading and from other people's readings as well, this is very much aimed at a God who is very much like you and I. And so um, for contemporary analytic philosophers of religion, uh, I take it that they're more kind of aimed at this kind of theistic conceptualist, um, theistic personalist uh, view of God or neoclassical theist uh, depiction of God rather than um, the God of pseudo Dionysius or the conception of God from how uh, kind of a Blackfriar interpretation of uh, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, and so I don't think that it's like uh, necessarily atheistic. I mean, you do have strong atheistic traditions that develop within Buddhism and, and, and all theological arguments that definitely do develop. But with Buddha himself, I mean, he's not really committed to metaphysics, right? Like, so he gets asked on several different occasions, um, you know, what, what, what do we make sense uh, about the soul or about, uh, you know, the cosmos this or the cosmos that? Like, what, what are our views on this? And Buddha doesn't like to give uh, responses. He's like, oh, if I say this, you're going to think that. If I say this, you're going to think that. And he's kind of really non-metaphysically committed outside of these kind of um, uh, origination and impermanence theses. Um, so I, I don't think it necessarily is atheistic. Just to clarify for some of our viewers who are less theologically uh, trained, when so is the difference sort of like, well, if there's a God in sort of the like Zeus sense, where it's just yeah. sort of a human who's just expanded to a massive size and is stronger, like a superhero, like Thor in the Marvel universe, who's just super strong, the Buddhist would say, well, that's that's eventually going to die and be impermanent because that's mm -hmm. just another created thing. And yeah. so it doesn't have sort of lastingness. But perhaps there's a space for a, a, a god who's not a powerful creature within the universe, but is mm -hmm. somehow transcendently beyond the universe or grounds the is the one thing underlying all mm -hmm. of the other impermanent things at a deeper level, a God who's not a being, but being itself. Is that kind of what was getting yeah. me to get at here? Yeah. So uh, in the Buddhist tradition, like the gods are uh, pieces of furniture within the universe, <laughs> uh, at, 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 as you're mentioning, um, that are just affected by um, uh, the reality of suffering as, as anyone else and, and uh, these metaphysical theses and so forth. Um, and so, yeah, you do have some of that. And you also do have kind of like a, a kind of a, a better depiction of God uh, within kind of what I take to be, um, you know, my hero, Alvin Plantinga, or William Lane Craig would kind of endorse. Uh, that might be there as well, kind of critiquing this kind of conception of God. But the idea of the God beyond being sort of conception of God that I was, I was hinting at, I, I don't think that's there. And so I don't think they're addressing that sort of thing. Well, you brought up different versions of Buddhism. You already talked about the Mahayana tradition. And just for our audience, who might not know there are different traditions of Buddhism. Can you give us a quick overview of what are these traditions? Yeah, so there's like a lot of, um, you know, uh, ancient traditions within Buddhism. Um, in fact, there are some <laughs> that even um, have a conception of a, a permanent self. Uh, unlike how most people talk about Buddhism today, where, where it's almost like an essential component that there is no self. Um, and uh, uh, so it, it, you have kind of different traditions within Buddhism. Eventually, the Mahayana tradition ends up kind of eating, <laughs> um, uh, filling in the gaps uh, from these other traditions that have died out, especially the non-Orthodox traditions and so forth that die out. Um, the Mahayana tradition uh, can best be represented um, uh, from Nagarjuna and his middle way tradition, kind of within the larger Mahayana tradition. And so this is where you get like the MMK, uh, which is a really fun read for any philosopher where he just like runs reductio ad absurdums <laughs> uh, across the pages um, to try to get to his view of emptiness about reality. Um, and, and then you have a couple other different traditions uh, that are really popular today. You have the Theravada tradition, 
which is going to emphasize uh, monastical um, kind of supremacy and uh, emphasis on its centrality to enlightenment and so forth. Um, and, and those who par are part of the Theravada or, you know, they're, they're in this kind of lineage that we can trace back to um, uh, this, this particular sect or same thing with Mahayana. There's also like this kind of esoteric Buddhism uh, kind of as a third option, um, which there's not a lot of s s like uh, scholarly known arguments from my understanding uh, from these traditions. This is a lot of kind of esoteric passed down from teacher um, to, to disciple. And this is where you get kind of like um, kind of more tantric um, or um, uh, you know, maybe using experimental um, substances or alcohol <laughs> in order to try to become enlightened. And this is just kind of that, that um, type of Buddhism. Um, I, in my work, when I try to argue that theism, at least classical theism, is compatible with Buddhism, what I do is I try to take just kind of like a mirror approach of Buddhism, what I say. Um, so I don't deal with any particular tradition. You can kind of fault the project in some sense on that, where it's just like, well, you know, I want you to deal with a specific tradition, especially like religious scholars, right, who are less inclined to my 21st century analytic approach to, to things. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so I, I kind of follow Garfield um, and uh, Burton and Westerhoff, just kind of looking for a minimal thesis of Buddhism and, and uh, engage that. Well, could you maybe tell us a bit about the life and story of the Buddha? What is the role of Buddha in Buddhism? Is he a god, a teacher, a prophet? I mean, it's very easy in the West for us to just think of him as Jesus in the East. <laughs> and uh, so could you maybe help uh, nuance and make that more sophisticated for us? Uh, who is the Buddha? Yeah, so uh, there was, um, from my understanding, um, a time when people were like, is there like Buddha mythicism, right? Um, is there really, what was there really a Buddha? Is he really a historical person or just this kind of like made up guy, right? But as I understand it, contemporary scholarship is that, that there was um, uh, a, a real life uh, God, a real life Buddha where he uh, apparently um, from, from what the records we do have was, was uh, a, you know, an attractive guy, um, a guy that was wealthy, a guy that like was just starting a family, um, but he he um, one record shows that that he left his family, right overnight, and uh, he went out in search of enlightenment, and he tried lots of different ways to achieve enlightenment. I mean, he was he was disturbed and perplexed by by evil and suffering, and um, he uh, ends up. Uh, you know, trying even like various Hindu traditions and practices and so forth, trying to get alignment. He basically does this to the point of almost killing himself. Um, and finally, you know, he reaches uh, the enlightenment. He, he, he formulates uh, when, you know, what we call uh, the four noble truths. He comes to realize this and, uh, you know, ends up becoming like an evangelistic sect and uh, uh, sends out other disciples and, and, uh, Buddhist evangelists become very successful uh, in and around Asia. So uh, obviously originating in India. So. so all that to say, he would sort of function as just sort of a teacher. Then, yeah, right? that's I, right. Yeah. yeah, I even think there's like a Zen, if I remember this correctly. Um, there's like a Zen tradition. that's like, if you see the Buddha, kill the Buddha, <laughs> right? Because the, the, the point is to exaggerate and say like, um, you know, the Buddha is not... Um, our god right uh he's he gives us ingredients of reality he gives us the ingredients of reality he gives us uh, truths about reality he tells us how to have enlightenment um but you know that's that's it of course there are like mahayana traditions where um there are are, are versions of uh where you can ask a particular buddha to um almost accept him in your heart, <laughs> kind of like Jesus. Um, you say certain mantras. Um, this is in Pure Land Buddhism, uh, where when you die, um, he will use his, his powers and grace to reborn you in a pure land where you'll be able to be taught um, and reach enlightenment very easily. So this is especially helpful for those who 
um, uh, you know, aren't able to really live a, a monastic life, uh, who, who have to live life in the day to day. But, you know, you, 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 you sincerely ask, you sincerely do these mantras and uh, you'll be you'll be able to enter into the pure land where enlightenment will, will be had. So, I mean, there, there's obviously there's this idea of this Buddha nature that also develops that, that becomes kind of almost theistic in some sense. Um, but, yeah, if we're talking about, you know, the historical Buddha, you know, that we're, we're talking more of um, a great philosopher than a god. So you mentioned these historical perspectives about some traditions, dead traditions of the of Buddhism believe in a self, which implies that, you know, today with impermanence and these ideas of emptiness, that they don't believe in this idea of a self. And I'm sure many of our listeners are like, what does that even mean? <laughs> what does that mean? So what does it mean to say that the self does not exist? Is it illusion? And mm-hmm. if it is an illusion, how did that start? Where did that even come from? Yeah, so... Um... You know, by self here, I mean kind of like um, that there, there, we are one substance. You know, we are we we um, are this being who uh, subsists over time, who who continues to be over time, um, who uh, has the sort of conscious experiences, these beliefs that I'm having, these desires. You know, they're all kind of grounded within this one framework. Right within this one person or self, um, so that, that's that's here what I mean by the self. Uh, so yeah, traditionally most Buddhist schools will deny that there really is uh, a self in this way, um, and so uh, there's a question about, especially from a theistic framework. Yeah, so for us theists who are interested in um, dialogue with our Buddhist counterparts, can you can we make sense of any sort of self-identity on impermanence and interdependence. And I think you actually can a little bit, um, taking notes from Jonathan Edwards. Um, so I don't know if, if uh, your viewers will be familiar, but Jonathan Edwards, really important American theologian uh, within the Reformed tradition especially, um, he argues that we don't have identity. He basically affirms impermanence and interdependence. Um, and uh, there's this kind of idea where uh, we don't have intrinsic identity, but nonetheless, like, so there are various slices, right? Tyler slice one, two, three, four, five, I, you know, one billion, right? Um, while they don't have inherent identity, nonetheless, God can put his, ex- he can kind of collect all the slices and put his external stamp uh, and uh, kind of have this external identity that's not intrinsic, but external um, and we can call all these kind of collective slices where God puts his external authority on it, Tyler, right? And so you might be able to do that with uh, some of the these views that are espoused within Buddhism, um, which deny that there is this self in the way that I've described. Um, but yeah, so um, a lot of um, contemporary Buddhists, I'm thinking here, especially like someone like uh, Jan Westerhoff, uh, will say, hey, look, guys, the eliminative literature, right? Eliminativism and philosophy of mind. Uh, look what it's saying. Look what really, um, what we think consciousness is, is just really, you know, reducible, these kind of uh, physical facts, so to speak. Um, hey, science is kind of back, backing up Buddhist claims. So uh, on the strong end of the spectrum, you can have kind of a, an eliminativist outlook. Uh, however, like I said, there, are, there are, are weaker takes that one can have when it comes to the self. And of course, there are, like I said, a couple of traditions that actually do say, no, we do have a a permanent self. In fact, one tradition won't even separate the self from the permanent self from nirvana itself, uh, which might sound very uh, Hindu to some. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it's it's interesting because this idea of no self isn't just one of the views of Buddhism, right? For a lot of Buddhists that's the key to enlightenment to some mm-hmm. extent. Could you explore mm-hmm. that a bit and why that realization is so central? Yeah, so the the um, worry here is that uh, you know, part of, of since suffering is so um, located or connected with um, change, everything is like i said is in flux right nothing nothing keeps identity uh from moment to moment that a lot of evil 
is related to change in the world. And so what we desire, we desire permanence. We desire, and we look at each other as if we are permanent, independent creatures. Or that PlayStation 5, or soon to be PlayStation 6, is, is uh, you know, this permanent, independent fixture I just got to have in my life. Or this uh, particular person I need in my life, or, 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 or whatnot. And uh, uh, we see the world as this kind of uh, these these independent uh, features uh, that are permanent and fixed, and we kind of trick ourselves into thinking that that's that that that's what we need. I'm distinct. I'm not connected in any way to these things. I'm missing these things in my life, and now that's going to cause me kind of an existential pain. And obviously, just um, Yuji Nagasawa has a, a, a book coming out um, where he kind of recaps um, impermanence and how that links to suffering in the Buddhist literature, or at least in um, Japanese Buddhist literature, uh, especially, I think, um, kind of in the Renaissance time, maybe medieval time. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we see all these natural disasters that happen um, within uh, Japan at this time. So. Here, I, I'm even thinking of, I think it's the 1600s, 17th century, um, where it, I don't know if any of y'all have watched Shogun, um, but the, the TV show that's on right now, but there's like a massive earthquake, right? There's like massive earthquakes at this time. There are, there's lot, lots of different uh, big fires that occur that, that kill lots and lots of people, a uh, lot, lot of natural disasters. And it just like shows us that life is fleeting, that life is pain, that... Um, that uh, there is nothing that's going to be permanent, so to speak. And this causes us um, uh, great suffering. And so, yeah, there's, there's, there, there's the suffering is, is ultimately, though, caused by desire, desire for permanent. But the reality is it's not permanent. And so um, we need to kind of realize, have right realization about um, the nature of reality. And in doing so, um, we will um, at least significantly decrease uh, the sort of suffering that happens in, in our lives. Um, so that, that's kind of how this idea of permanence, uh, desire for permanence, belief in permanence, uh, these kind of false ideas, right? They, um, April Pass says we need uh, you know, the right beliefs, right? Um, right realization. Uh, this is how these kind of false beliefs hurt us and don't enable enlightenment. You touched on it a little bit, though, with Jonathan Edwards and some of the possible overlaps mm -hmm. between Christianity and Buddhism. And already when you're talking, I'm beginning to see some of the ways that Christianity both compares and contrasts to mm -hmm. Buddhism. But I want to put that question to you. What are the key differences and what are some key similarities? Right. So, um, in Eric Baldwin and I's work, um, Classical Theism and Buddhism, um, can't even remember the subtitle of it, but it's with Bloomsbury. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure it's the only book with that title, so you know, feel free to, to for your listeners to um, Google it. Uh, first off, we argue that since impermanence and interdependence applies to things or objects or phenomena, as these various contemporary analytic Buddhist philosophers um, espouse, if you're of the Neoplatonist tradition or the what I call the Blackfriar Thomist tradition, where God is not a thing, um, he's rather the grounding of all things, right? You might think, well, how can God, how is God not a thing? Well, uh, if, if we're talking about the grounding of all things and we don't want some sort of um, self explanation or cause, uh, then, you know, we, we need to, to ground all things outside of the things. And so God is the grounding of, of all things, you know, it goes something like this. You can see this type of argument, especially, um, and, um, uh, McCabe. Um, but, uh, uh, so since these theses don't apply to God, if God's not a thing, then, um, we can affirm impermanence and interdependence and still be theists believing in the classical conception of God. Uh, and that's even taking kind of a more um, uh, Mahayana spin on on emptiness and, and whatever we're talking about being empty. 
course, you have Buddhist tradition saying that um, these dharmas aren't empty or, or, or whatnot. And again, I've already mentioned the self. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I mean, the, 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 this is kind of the, the move to go here that, that we make in that first chapter. Um, you have uh, other traditions within the, the Mahayana tradition where uh, emptiness is kind of almost described as um, something, and I've, I've actually just learned of this recently, uh, something kind of positive. And this, the, the, there's some, some the emptiness is, 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 is linked to some sort of positive control of reality. Um, that's not the sort of traditions that I deal with in my book. Um, but you do have that uh, in, I think, especially some Chinese traditions. Um, you have, let's see, um, uh, other traditions that'll say that, yeah, all these things are empty. Uh, this kind of um, uh, noumenal phenomenal tradi uh, 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 tradition. Uh, and they'll say that nonetheless, that doesn't mean that all being is, is empty. Um, it's just all the things we encounter are all empty, right? So it kind of leaves room for there's something to be beyond that. Um, uh, Keith Ward argues that uh, nirvana, especially in one particular Buddhist text, is described as like pure bliss, right? It's described as happiness. It's described in all these positive terms. And so maybe nirvana uh, actually kind of plays this this functional theistic role, especially if you're kind of more interested in the, the classical um, theistic tradition that I've, that I've mentioned. Um, so you have, you have this, and I, I've already mentioned um, the kind of pure land traditions, which it's like <laughs> all about grace and, and, and uh, enlightenment uh, that leads to enlightenment and, and being reborn in a new land, that sort of thing. Um, the, the, I think that there actually is deep um, concord with these traditions because like, on a theist tradition, um, what's the problem? The problem is that we think we are ultimate reality. We think that we are, oh, sorry, my lights went out there. We think that we are ultimate reality. We think that, that we are fundamental. But classical theism says, no, God is existence itself. God is being itself. We participate in him, but we don't exist in the same way that he is. He is ultimate reality, right? We are not. Uh, and so it's, it's, again, it's a confusion about what is ultimately real and, and um, uh, kind of what is less real. And so uh, given that's the case, right, um, uh, this causes obviously disconnection between us and God, between us and ultimate reality, you could say, uh, and this causes pain and suffering. And so we need to come to the right realization that um, ultimately all things are empty. That ultimately all things are are are, are at least interdependent. Um, maybe you want to parse impermanence a little bit differently depending on you know the sort of theist we are. Um, but you know, so we can we can agree to this while also thinking that um, God exists. You can have similar uh, ethical frameworks. I mean, we can we try to split the Ten Commandments and the the Eightfold Path and break it up and uh, um, talk about that. Um, and how similarity there is. There's this, like I said, a kind of a, a cohesive soteriological dimension uh, that Buddhism and theism have. Um, and so if, if you think that theism can be consistent with Buddhism and the soteriological and ethical systems also mesh quite well, uh, then I think there's a lot of similarities to go for. And I think emphasizing those similarities uh, rather than our differences um, not only makes... Uh, our Christian faith, I think, stronger um, because it's showing that God hasn't been silent to every single person in the world except for the Jews and then the Christians, <laughs> but that God, as you know, Vatican II, I'm sorry, Catholic, um, Vatican II, uh, it's, it's clear that, that God has a, a, a hidden um, presence in these other traditions, and all truths are God's truth, and that he, he could be providentially leading them to, to come up with lots of different true things, and so our job then is to kind of present the evidence for the resurrection and, um, you know, explain the gospel. Real quick, well, there's there's a thumping noise occasionally, and it's kind of actually drowning out. Your, oh, I'm so sorry. I could have, was it this? Yes. Okay, sorry. It. I was tapping on my computer. My apologies. Oh, yeah, just because, I just want to make the note of that because uh, then it's like oh, drowns thump, out you. Somebody thump, out your, thump. Your well, drawing on this uh 
contrast between self and other in the sense that ultimately there is no self and other. There's just sort of interconnected unity. Mm-hmm. How is it that the self begins or the, the illusion of the self, where does that illusion come from? If all things are one and interconnected, how do we get this illusion of selfhood? Is, is there an equivalent to a fall narrative in mm-hmm. Buddhism where, you know, so I, um, that's a good question. I'm not sure if there is kind of something like a, a fall um, narrative. Uh, obviously, there's Mara, like this, this Satan figure who tempts us, <laughs> uh, who, who like perverts our enlightenment. There is that. Um, but uh, yeah, I imagine, especially the more scientifically informed Buddhists, which are uh, kind of the Buddhists I, I engage a little bit more with um, than on the religious spectrum, uh would kind of give some sort of eliminativist account of the illusion of the self. Well, let's talk a little bit about karma, because this is where a lot of people come to think of Buddhism is in the idea of karma, also Hinduism as well. But there's some distinction between what is understood by karma between these different traditions. Can you help us parse that out? Yeah, so there's actually kind of more reductivistic accounts of karma and then more of the supernatural um, accounts of karma. And so, again, kind of the, the Buddhists that, that uh, I typically read would probably be more inclined to kind of this reductive account. The supernatural account is probably what we're all familiar with when we talk about this, right? Where uh, there's almost like this cosmic scale or something <laughs> that, uh, you know, we can add good stuff into and that's going to affect our life. Uh, when we get reincarnated, going to put us in a better position to have right realization, right? Um, Obviously, the the negative things that we put into the world are going to go up here, and that's going to ultimately weigh and factor where we're going to spend our next um, incarnation, right? Um, Right. There's a more naturalistic way, though, of understanding that. And that's just that uh, since we're all connected in some sense, uh, you know, conceptually and causally, that that sort of thing, that whatever I put out into the world that negatively uh, affects my own um, karma, I'm also like affecting others' karma. And uh, since um, ultimately putting in bad things into the world is going to prevent me from reaching enlightenment and uh, reaching and, and maybe even others reaching enlightenment as well. Uh, and so the good things that I that I do, right? Are going to lead me to enlightenment, right realization, uh, and so you know in that sense, good karma helps me reach right realization. Now, uh, you might think that there aren't rebirths or uh, like kind of typically what's described, say within Hinduism or in uh, popular versions of Buddhism, um, or maybe you do go that route. You know, they're like kind of like I said, the more kind of scientific Buddhists. Um, that I imagine they're like, ah, that whole rebirth idea, we don't, we don't, we, we don't really need that there. Uh, but nonetheless, the, there is karma. And karma is just those actions that, you know, good karma is just those actions that help lead us to enlightenment and bad actions that prevent us. And we do enough bad actions, we're not going to reach enlightenment. Um, so we're not going to be in that, that position. So you can go with either route. In our book, um, we took a reductive account as, as Christians, as, uh, you know, both of us are Orthodox Catholics. Um, we're not so inclined to think that, that there's going to be reincarnations of us <laughs> and so on and so forth. So we take this kind of reductive account. Well, Tolkien was a Catholic, right? So reincarnation smuggled in with the elves. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, um, so people often contrast Christian grace with works-based karma. Mm. Uh, is that a helpful contrast or is that just confused? Yeah, yeah. Um... My initial thoughts when you say that is is confused, right? Because um, grace isn't about something that we have done, uh, at least in kind of the Christian context. Uh, it's about Christ's merits, Christ's righteousness, Christ's um, what he's done. And in my Catholic context, how that, you know, how we end up participating in that and how that is, uh, comes out through us and is infused uh, into us and so forth. Um and so, and even in some sense, to, to um, appease my reform brothers, in some sense, I'm even fine with saying that, that it's a foreign righteousness that comes to us, right? Uh, karma, if it's, if it's based off of your karma, 
<laughs> right? Then it seems kind of like we're talking about based off your works, so to speak. And I do want to stay away from that sort of language. However, right, if we're talking about the karma that someone else has accomplished, <laughs> right, um, th then that's fully in line with Christian thinking. Um, that's the whole idea is that, that Jesus has perfect karma <laughs> and we'll, we'll get that foreign com karma, uh, you know, into us and that we are now going to be connected with him. So. Is there any equivalent where someone else's karma in the Buddhist system can somehow be lent to you? Yes. Or is there. So in the okay. pure land traditions that, 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 that's exactly what happens. So there is, in a sense, karma can become a means of grace. Then. That's right. That's right. So this is probably shattering a lot of people's understandings of what Buddhism is. So while we're on the topic of myth busting, what are some other common myths and mis misunderstandings people have about Buddhism? Yeah, um, I think the the biggest one is in reference to it being at odds with with God. Um, being at odds with any sort of identification of uh, even external identity. Uh, I think those are probably two of the, the, the bigger ones. Um, that also that it's, it's, it's necessarily inconsistent with other religious traditions. And so like if you go to China, for example, I, I lived there for a few years in Macau and spent some time in Zhuhai and uh, uh, a little bit further up. Um, and, uh, you know, people who practice Buddhism don't look at Buddhism as an exclusive religious tradition. Um, they might also identify as Taoists and Confucians all at the same time. And, uh, so I, I think it's kind of important. What are the minimal theses that are espoused in Buddhism? How should we interpret them? And interpreting them in these ways, does that leave room open for uh, adopting additional worldviews. So I, th I think that's kind of the, a big misconception. So are you, uh, I mean, just thinking about the cumulative effect of this conversation, are you kind of leaning towards the idea that a Buddhist could become a Christian and do both genuinely and fully and vice versa, that a, an Orthodox Christian could also identify as a Buddhist? Yeah, definitely a theist. So the, the book Classical Theism and Buddhism, that's, a, that's the, our main thesis, uh, the, thesis is that the, classical theism is consistent with Buddhist doctrine, ethical, sociological, and metaphysical. Um, Christian? I think so, actually. Um, if we're talking about just kind of like endorsing the Nicene Creed, like I said earlier, I think Jonathan Edwards is like a crypto-Buddhist Christian. Um, but uh, um, Catholic, that's another question. Um, that 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 I, I won't say yes or no. I don't know. Um, I haven't tried to argue or think about that too too much. But uh, yeah, there's definitely been some attempts. I think Thomas Merton, right, as well as David Steenel Rost, a little bit more recently, have been both Catholic monks and Buddhist monks simultaneously. Hmm. And I, I, I'll leave it up to our audience to decide <laughs> how well they succeeded in doing right. that. Well, I don't want to leave it to the audience because a terrifying number of our audience probably don't even think of Catholics as Christian. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll have an episode on that. So the, just kind of on that, then, is there anything else that you feel like we could just learn from Buddhism? Like, what is Buddhism doing that maybe we as Christians could take notes about? Yeah, well, I, th I think this idea, an emphasis on... Uh, interdependence and impermanence, which you know leads us to the conclusion, in part at least, of emptiness. Um, that uh, I think that that actually can be beneficial. Is kind of meditating on and thinking on. Um, I um, I'm dependent causally. I'm dependent conceptually on on um, others. Ultimately, on God. Um, and uh, that um, I'm not really uh, the end all of reality. Um, in fact, I'm connected with reality. I'm connected with um, that which uh, you know maybe uh, I uh, desire. Um, um, but ultimately, it's all about God, right? Um, so I, I think there is some actually some framework to to kind of when we think about our our nature, and when we think about 
it being empty. I think that that actually does put life in perspective. Um, and then uh, ultimately, uh, I think that talking about um, talking about I lost my train of thought again. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. It did. It didn't exist to begin with. It's it okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. There's only individual train cars, but there's no cumulative thing called the train. The train car. That's there's right. It's just the caboose. Yes. Well, you know, like I, I kind of on that as a as a great businessman once said. Oh yes, you know, I was going to say. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, the, the, there actually has been some theological work done, especially within kind of a Japanese Buddhist framework, on the inner exchange between uh the kenosis and emptiness so uh there are obviously um unorthodox views of kenosis theology that will want to Can avoid you explain that what kenosis is the, uh, the idea of jesus emptying himself and so some versions are like he emptied himself of deity and then he obtained deity once again right um uh, but uh, there might be something there when, when uh not that particular version but maybe some weaker versions where there could be some interplay between emptiness and, and what Christ does, uh, especially as a spouse in like say Philippians two. Um, so that, that also might be um, something worthwhile to think about as a Christian. Well, while we're talking about nothingness or Nile uh, or, you know, in, in soccer, nil, nil, zero, zero, mm -hmm. sometimes Buddhists get called nihilists. Mm -hmm. We've touched a bit on that. Why might that be? And how accurate or non-accurate do you think that accusation is? Yeah, so Buddhists will definitely want to say, no, we're non nihilists Like, for the millionth time, guys, <laughs> right? Um, the reason why they say they're not, uh, it, even though if you read, like, the MMK from Nagarjuna, kind of, kind of, you could kind of get that impression, um, is because they'll say, no, 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 there's, there's still conventional truths. There's still kind of the conventional self. There's still these... Uh, conventional ways of, 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 uh, reality. Um, so it's, they would say it's like the nice in between actually, um, because there's still like room for some reality at this kind of conventional level. Um, but yet kind of at the noumenal level, so to speak, to use a Kantian term, uh, you know, then, then we're talking about emptiness. And so it's neither nihilistic or like full embrace of, um, uh, uh strong ontology about all things that exist right it's kind of a, this this nice go in between so we can't call ourselves nihilists nihilists have no you know no conventional truths there's no room for for um the self in any of these categories and um uh distinctions within any, any of these categories so nihilist is nihilism is worse right? whether you want to think that that's enough to save the the buddhists from um the nihilist uh, uh, complaint or accusation, you know, I'll let the audience decide if that's, that's, if that's enough. Um, however, obviously, if the Buddhist is a theist, or if the Buddhist takes nirvana to be some positive aspect to reality, or if the Buddhist takes the existence of a self, um, then uh, it seems like that the, they wouldn't be a nihilist, you know, if they take one of these three routes. So Buddhism obviously seems like it's a very diverse tradition, <laughs> and it's tough to summarize. Now, we have your work as one work, but are there other ways that people can go out, other resources that you would recommend for people to go learn about Buddhism? Yeah, so I would definitely, like I said earlier, um, um, Garfield's Engaging Buddhism definitely is must-have, and I enjoy his commentary uh, 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 with on Nagarjuna uh, as well. It's an additional book that was published a few years prior. Um, uh, let's see, uh, David Burton's um, book, uh, you can actually get it for a, a decent price on Kindle if you pull it up. It's got that classic blue Rutledge uh, cover, which is blue. <laughs> um, uh, that, that's also a really good book. Um, if you want kind of especially kind of a Nagarjuna interpretation to contemporary philosophy and, and, and cognitive science and stuff, you might especially be interested in Jan Westerhoff's uh, volume. Uh yeah, uh, so th those would be kind of like the the general works that I would encourage people to to check out if if they were interested in that sort of thing. Um, Keith Ward in his Divine Revelation book, um, he has this nice bit on Buddhism and the kind of positive Nirvana stance and Buddha nature, 
which could resemble uh, theism. Um, so I would uh, also recommend that that one as well. Besides, of course, classical theism and Buddhism. But so we've talked a lot about resources on Buddhism, but maybe some of our listeners are like, I want to hear more from this guy. I want to hear more from Tyler McNabb because you do a lot more than just classical theism and Buddhism. Can you tell us some about your work, maybe what you're currently working on and where our audience can find more from what you've done? Yeah, so actually probably in the like analytic philosophy religion circles, I'm probably actually more known for my work in religious epistemology. Um, so um, I've got a nice element on uh, from Cambridge on religious epistemology, where I defend a, basically a Plantigian approach, um, which I think is actually kind of like a, a pseudo, or not pseudo, um, a proto, uh, a, Aquinas approach, to mystic approach. Um, but um, uh, yeah, and I'm the editor of the, one of the editors of the Cambridge Handbook to Religious Epistemology, and I've got a debating Christian religious epistemology with Bloomsbury. So if you like Planiga, if you like the idea that religious belief is natural to us and, and rational, even apart from argument, you might look into some of that work. As my current work now, um, I'm kind of just researching, going through uh, actually um, Taoism um, literature and um, thinking about writing at least a paper on uh, arguing for a, a classical theist conception of of um, of Taoism of, of the Tao, uh, I've done that a little bit with my co-author Eric Baldwin. We have a chapter in the um, Rutledge book on classical theism that uh, edited by Coons and um, and Fuque, uh, where we look at Buddhism, Taoism, Shankara's Advaita Vedanta, Hinduism, and so forth, and and do a little bit of synthesis there, but kind of going a deeper into that is, is, is what currently I'm, I'm doing. And then I've got a book on evangelism that's supposed to be published with Cascade maybe later this year. It's uh, an analytic theology of evangelism from a classical theist point of view, where I actually do have a chapter, ironically, um, talking about uh, a Christology of other religions and how that might affect evangelism. Thanks again for listening to the Spiritually Incorrect Podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to like and subscribe below, or to check us out on Spotify. And if you want to hear more from this week's episode or guest, our Patreon account has exclusive unaired content, often featuring up to an hour of additional footage and interviews for each episode. We save some of the most controversial and pulse-pounding topics just for our Patreon members. Members get access to that, plus a chance to meet monthly with Jonathan and I. Suggest episode topics, join us live for an episode to ask the special guests questions, or even get a personalized episode custom-made just for you. Check out our Patreon link in the description below. And don't forget to check out our official website at spirituallyincorrectpodcast.com to see what else you're missing out on. Sound effects from Zapspot.com. Special thanks to Jordan Birch, whose song Starry Night provides the intro and outro for this podcast. You can hear more of his music on YouTube or Spotify.